Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of To Be A Cat by Matt Haig. Here it is. A pretty battered edition. I got it from the uh, book exchange at my local Morrison's, which is a supermarket. It's like a charity thing where you can take a book and you leave some money for a, a charity, so I picked it up because why not? Uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I've been describing this as like The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, but for kids. Um, I'm also still reading it at the time of filming it so it's gonna be a bit of a vlog rather than uh, a straight review a bit of both anyway the blurb Dane reads what if I told you that tomorrow you'd wake up as a cat that's right you heard me a cat whiskers for full put whiskers fur four paws a tail the real deal you might not believe me but really you should be thanking me most people don't have any kind of warning you see it comes as a complete shock to them it came as a shock to Barney Willow by the winner of the Blue Peter Book of the Year Award and the Nestle Children's Book Prize Gold Award. To be a cat, Matt Haig. Let's dive on him. So, right at the beginning, as I say, my copy's a bit battered. I can see from here, it was a Booker Hill School copy. Don't know how it ended up at the book exchange at Morrison's, but there you go. And we have, uh, we begin with a quote. Be careful what you wish for. Old saying said by miserable people everywhere. Okay, so I quite like the big, the bit at the beginning. Just uh, page one, I'm going to read you the whole thing here because I tabbed out a couple of things. Um, and honestly, it's just a great introduction. Here is a secret I shouldn't really tell you, but I will because I just can't help it. It's too big, too good. Okay, sit down, get ready, brace yourself, have some emergency chocolate handy, squeeze a big cushion. Here it is. Cats are magic. That's right, cats. They're magic. They are powers you and I can only dream of. But even as I tell you this, I can see what you're thinking. You're thinking, no they don't. Cats are just cute little pets who sleep next to radiators all day long. To which I would say, that's just what they want you to think. And now you're thinking, those are just words in a story written by some author with a boring name. And authors aren't to be trusted one bit because they tell lies for a living. And he says, you're a little bit right, but stories aren't always lied. There are things stored in all our imaginations, hence the name stories, and it's the author's job to point them out. Now, I don't normally like it when the author uh, directly addresses the reader, but in this I think it works, probably because it's a kid's book as well. Um, and he lists out some of the very special things that every cat who ever prowled the earth is capable of doing, such as the ability to understand a thousand different animal languages, including gerbil, antelope, and the ridiculously complicated goldfish. Fence balancing. The capability of napping anywhere, laps, kitchen floors, on top of TVs when the theme tune to the news is blasting at full volume. Smelling sardines from two miles away. Purring, trust me, that is magic. The capacity via their whiskers to sense approaching dogs. Now hasn't there been some research that shows that yes, actually cat purrs are, they do have healing benefits. I mean, I don't know how much I trust that, but I've heard that anyway. There's a bully called Gavin who sticks pins in Barney's chair. And he says, or if he had no drawing pins, just pull him back the chair seconds before Barney sat down. Oh yes, Gavin had read the chair torture chapter in the bully's handbook at least a hundred times. I actually have a little sky, you probably can't see it on the video, but over my eye there. And that's from when somebody did ex exactly that. They pushed their chair back as I was walking past in primary school and I tripped over it and banged my head into a bookcase. And then everybody laughed at me and I went to the floor and I came back and went like that. And then everyone went, Ugh because there was blood all over my face and all over my hand and then the deputy head took me to the hospital and told me that if I got blood in her car she would kill me and then Haig says uh, I'm not good with promises they make me itchy when he uh, interrupts the narrative again but again it's fine it, it works in the context of the book it didn't annoy me like it normally would uh, we get a reference to Barney who's the main character he'd even once got in trouble in the playground for reading his favorite book the water babies by Charles Kingsley reading at break how dare you come to my office which is awful, like you should never punish a kid for reading. Uh, there are reasons why that happens, uh, which you discover later on. And also that book itself plays a kind of an important role in the plot too. And Barney, um, Barney has a bad day basically and he's talking to his friend Rissa and she says, listen Barnes, I'm there for you, okay? I know you might get in an incy wincy bit of trouble tonight, but just think this is only a tiny, tiny moment in time. Think of the stars, think of our star, the sun. It is billions of years old, and it's gonna keep shining whatever happens. Look, in a year's time, this will be nothing. In 10 years time, when you've got a long beard, you won't even remember it. I won't have a long beard, said Barney. I won't even have a short one. Hey, my dad's got a beard. There is nada wrong with beards, I'll have you know. Think of all the great important people in history. Jesus, Emperor Hadrian, um, Father Christmas. They all had beards. I have a beard, little one. So we get um, the metamorphosis happens where Barney becomes a cat. And I just thought this was cool, kind of highlighting the difference between the ways we hear. Noises. His mother taking an item of cutlery from a kitchen drawer. Something he wouldn't normally have been able to hear from up here. Now it was as sharp as if he was in the room with her. 
She was feeding Gusta. He heard the spoon tap three times against the ceramic bowl, shaking off the dog food. And we learn how Gusta speaks as a King Charles Spaniel, and uh, so his dialogue we get. What are you doing here? What is your intention? Speak, speak, I beseech you. And then Barney says, it's me. And Gusta says, confine your tongue. Do you know who you're talking to? I am a King Charles Spaniel. My ancestors were there to witness the restoration of the King of England. They helped make this country what it is today. And like all my noble breed, I have a strong set of principles that I live by religiously. Of the utmost importance is this. Never let an uninvited feline into your house. If such a thing should happen, one has no choice but to kill said feline. So, you furry vagabond, I suggest you prepare to die. And Barney tries to shout, mum, mum, mum. And then in the narrative it says, three pathetic meows, not even worthy of speech marks. I just thought that was funny. So we get this bit here. Um, uh, Barney's talking to a, a cat called Mocha. There are three types of cats, she said. Then name them. There are swipers who are tough street cats and who you need to be scared of. Then there are firesides like me who have owners and who generally prefer staying at home. We aren't scary as a rule, not unless you try and bathe us. Well, apart from the... She hesitated, as if frightened to finish the sentence. Apart from the terror cat. The terror cat? Who's that? Mocha came closer to whisper, I hope you never find out. Why? What makes him so scary? He was just a normal cat once, but then he changed just as a night follows a sunset, Mocha said with a shudder. He developed powers, dark and evil powers, and became something else. He looked the same, but he was very, very different. And this was the point at which I started to get an idea of... Uh, who the terror cat might actually be, but I don't want to spoil it for you. And this is quite sad because, so his parents divorced. Uh, my parents divorced when I was a kid as well, so I found that kind of interesting to read in the fiction, but Barney had felt a bit like this before, in the old days before his parents divorced. Obviously he'd never actually been a cat, but he felt that feeling of not having a voice, or rather not having a voice that anyone properly listened to. And we get, when he was younger, he didn't really know what divorce meant, although he knew it wasn't good. How could a word with the letters D, I, and E in it, in that order, mean something nice? Then we get some advice directly from Matt Haig. He says, here's some advice. If you ever become a cat, and it's more likely than you might imagine, there's about a one in 5,000 chance according to the latest estimates. Don't think about things too much. So, um, Rissa gets told off for using a phone on the school bus. There's a rule about, uh, yeah, well, they say, sorry, rules is rules. Using phones on school buses leads to mugging. That's a known fact, is it now? And we learn about Miss Whipmire, who is the equivalent of Miss Trunchbull. She is the evil head teacher. Um, she, we get... They also knew she looked quite old. In fact, she looked about 200, but obviously she wasn't. She was just living on misery time. If you don't already know, misery time means that miserable people get old very much quicker than happy people. Sour thoughts inside your head apparently make it look like a pickled walnut quite quickly. <laughs> and Miss Whitmire gets this great line, it's a bit bleak for a children's book, but she says we all end up in the dark sooner or later. So we get the heroic return of the author here. Uh, hello, only me, the author again. I've been trying to keep out of the way letting this story go on by itself. You gotta let the little darlings go eventually. And it's been doing alright, I think. Only a couple of little slips, but it's back on its feet. Um, and then he points out something that he'd kind of alluded to at the beginning. And I love this as well. This is great. Again, bearing in mind this is a kid's book. Rissa's mum always said, No one can make you feel bad about yourself without your consent. Which meant that you can't control what people said about you, but you can control how you feel about what they said. Oh, and if Rissa was ever really stressed, she followed her dad's advice and spoke the magic calming word under her breath. Marmalade. And that comes into play quite often. So uh, school lunchtime, in the dining hall, Rissa sat at a table on her own, eating the only vegetarian option, cheese and tomato pizza made with what was meant to be white bread but tasted more like bath sponge. And that sucks because that means there's no vegan options. So Barney, while he's as a cat, uh, he goes to the library that his mum works at and uh, we get this, which I think is very beautiful. It was a city of books. Every aisle between the towering bookshelves was street size. The shelves themselves seemed impossibly high, but at least he was unseen here. Barney had deliberately chosen an aisle with no people. He looked up and saw the same label on all the shelves. Classic literature, authors S to Z. He saw books with spines as tall and wide as doors, large names on them. William Shakespeare, Leo Tolstoy, Mark Twain, Voltaire. Barney had no idea that all four of these very famous dead writers had at one time or another been cats, or that one of them had even admitted to having been a cat. That one was Mark Twain, who had written very brilliant books about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, who were both boys but acted more like wild and adventurous cats, and were based on Mark Twain's own early years as a tomcat, hence the clue Tom Sawyer. Indeed, as I think I've told you, most of the really brilliant people who have ever lived have been cats at one time or another, and that is because many of the great cat geniuses, in cat form, get very fed up of not having the kind of wiggly thumbs and fingers that let you write a book. And then, uh, again, going back to what I said earlier about this basically being Kafka, his plan is he's going to find the water babies, 
um, by Charles Kingsley, which we mentioned earlier, because it's his favourite book. So if he's a cat and he knocks over this book, his mum will see it and be like, that's my son. And we get trouble was the water babies was nowhere to be seen, which was very weird because Barney was sure he was the only person who ever took it out of the library. Well, since 1982 anyway. So Barney looked for another book that he liked, but he couldn't see any except the Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling, which he hadn't actually really liked very much, but which was at least a book his mum knew he'd read. It was on the third shelf, so he tried to jump, but Barney couldn't get anywhere near where he wanted to be. All he did was bring down another book, a hardback which fell on top of him. He could see the cover with the scary looking block capitals Kafka and Metamorphosis falling towards him before the inevitable clunk on his head. So the plan had failed. But obviously it kind of worked. But then it's not actually mentioned again anyway. And uh, then we get the Cattery here. So uh, the chapter the Cattery. Hi, it's the author again. Now I know what you're wondering. You're wondering, hey, what happened to that cat you mentioned nearly 100 pages ago? Mosha or whatever her name was. Oh, you're not wondering that? Oh dear, that author MRMR, Mind Reading My Readers kit, my mum bought me for Christmas, must be going a bit faulty. Never mind, I'll tell you about Mocha anyway, because by telling you about her, I'll be really be telling you about something much more important. And we learn that TLC means two-legged cat, which is street slang for cats that have been turned to humans. Oh, then um, Barney ends up inside Gavin's house, obviously he's still a cat, um, but yeah, the doorbell rings and his mum shouts, Gavin, could you get that? I'm on my exercise bike, which I tabbed out and thought was interesting because I was reading this while on an exercise bike at the gym. So we learn a bit more about Riss's family and how odd they are. They lived on a barge for a start and they didn't even own a TV, let alone watch one. And they could spend hours talking about star formations. They had a computer but he'd never seen it. They did have a phone too, but one that looked like it came from 1973. And Rissa's dad had his big beard and wore long woolly jumpers with holes in them almost down to his knees and made vegetarian meals full of strange ingredients like quinoa and buckwheat. Those are the kind of meals that I make. Except I've never made anything with buckwheat, I don't really know how you'd use it. So yes, then we find uh, in a chapter called A Heavy Truth, Barney discovers what happens to his dad. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it here. His dad is um, that cat that everyone was scared of. Um, it took a moment for it to sink in, several moments actually, and long ones. He wanted to hug his dad, and his dad wanted to hug him back, but hugging's not so easy when you're a cat, so they purred mutual love and head nuzzled, which was as close as they could get, which I thought was very sweet. And yes, hugging probably is not easy if you're a cat. And then, um, basically Barney's dad is convincing the dog Buster that they are who they say they are. He says, and you hate chocolate, even nice human chocolate. When I gave you some, you spat it on the carpet. And then Guster goes, one can't abide chocolate, this is true. But aren't you not supposed to, I thought chocolate was poisonous to dogs, or is that just like an urban legend? I love this bit as well. Um, but Barney's mum couldn't believe this. She really physically couldn't. You see, the space in your brain for things you are prepared to believe in gets smaller as you get older. Each year the area shrinks like the age rings of a tree trunk in reverse. And Barney's mum was now 43 years old, which left her with quite a small circle of believability. And now we get some deep kind of philosophy here. Yes, yeah, school hadn't been much fun recently, but he had a warm home full of nice human things and a mum who loved him and the best best friend who'd ever lived. Life wasn't ever one ingredient, it was several, and some flavours were bad and some were good, but love was the strongest of all. If you were loved, you had everything. It was the milk that made the cereal of life worth tasting. And then um, we learn why it's better to be a human. As a human, you could live seven times as long, buy your own food in supermarkets, and never be separated from me. The humans have the best of this world, not the cats. And humans are all vile and ungrateful things, so they've got no right to everything they have. Which is a fair point, but it comes from the, the mouth of the evil cat turned human, uh, who happens to be the headmistress, spoiler alert. And um, yeah, the police come along as uh, Barney gets turned back into a human and we get this. The police inside saw nothing except a psychotic head teacher trying to strangle a 12 year old boy wearing no clothes. And no matter what the circumstances, that never looks particularly good. And I just want to read this final, final bit here. So this is the bit after the end in which the author has to have the last word. So there we are, the happy ending. I love a happy ending. It makes me feel all warm and cosy inside. Like those hot water bottles you get which have their own woolly covers. Especially when the happy ending is part of a true story. And yes, this is a true story. The world is full of humans who used to be cats and cats who used to be humans. So the next time you see a cat looking up at you with those pleading eyes and that strong purr, just remember, it might want to jump into your life rather than jump onto your lap. But don't worry. You'll be fine, look at you. You're brilliant, a human being with um, incredible taste in books. No wonder all those cats who have wanted to be you have failed. Every day that you wake up as yourself and see that genius in the mirror is another reason to stay happy. Well done you. No, seriously, well done. Right, I'd better go as I'm a bit sleepy and fancy a, by the radio. Sleep in the bed. Yours truly, Cat Matt Haig. 
So yes, to be a cat by Matt Haig, four out of five for me is very endearing. Um, normally I don't like it when you get that stuff of like the author kind of interrupting the flow of the story directly, addressing the reader, you know, drawing your knowledge, drawing your attention to the fact that it is a work of fiction. But I think it worked in this because it was just such a playful book. Definitely one for cat lovers. Great book for kids as well. And it actually has touches on some deeper, deeper themes as well, which not all kids literature does. I think it kind of entertains kids without speaking down to them. Very humorous. I'm going to be giving it to my girlfriend Shay. And yes, To Be a Cat by Matt Haig, four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made up to be a cat by Matt Haig. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.